for your congregation. Coming up, get up, your house is burning down. <laughs> I'm just giving you some ideas, Pastor. Great, thank you. C.J. Rhodes in the house live and in the Trustmark studio. The Economic Outlook for Growth in 2020 is outstanding. Make sure your business takes full advantage by putting the Trustmark Small Business Team financial experts on your team. Trustmark.com, member FDIC. In the studio, and I haven't seen you in a while. Good morning, Dean. It's good to have you. Yeah, glad to be back. Folks who don't know, uh, the son of famed civil rights attorney Carol Rhodes Sr., C.J. received his calling to gospel ministry in the year 2000. My God, 20 years ago. That's right. This July. Two months after graduating with honors from Hazelhurst High School. Continued to lead during uh, his time at the University of Mississippi. Co-founded the Department of uh, Minority Affairs. Uh, also founded or co-founded two college ministries, an associate minister to youth and young adults at Clear Creek Missionary Baptist Church. Still there? Still no, that was, that, well, no, that was way that was back when I was in and Mount Home uh, And Mount Home uh, Hope Baptist Church also. Now you're still at Mount Helm Baptist Church at Mount Helm. here in Jackson. And also uh, a couple of days a week at, um, at Alcorn State University. You've been there since 2013. Yep, yep. Have the students driven you crazy yet, or are they are they are they as grounded as you were when you were in college? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that second question, but uh, uh, they're very life giving. Um, yeah. I, I teach ethics, and most of my students have never had a background in philosophy, and so to see yeah. them come alive in the class and ask questions, uh, or even come to me personally asking about that is ministry and though. what 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 questions do they ask? Oh Lord, I mean. We, we run the gamut from everything from questions around yeah. uh, politics, abortion, um, just just their own life journey, what what a sense of purpose and calling may look like in their lives. I'm, I, I walk on this question softly. There are a lot of things people talk, especially boomers, say negatively toward the millennials, mm-hmm. but there are some good traits that, that I see. Yeah. Would you would you verify that? I mean, the, oh, you absolutely. talk all the time. I mean, I do see some good things. I, I see, I see them being more introspective to a point. Sometimes I, I see them reaching out for the answers in a different manner. But yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it. Very introspective. Yeah, I, I see students who are intrigued about not just making money but making a life. Uh, who are, are wrestling with deep thoughts, uh, who really just want someone to walk alongside them and help mentor them and guide them in, in life directions. And so a number of the young people I've mentored, some of them are now members of our church. Uh, they've, some of others have gone on to do great things in law school and, and, and whatnot. So I'm I'm excited. If, if all millennials like the ones I get to teach at yeah. Alcorn, I'm, I'm excited about the future. When we look back on this, when again, C.J. Rhodes is my guest, and CJ, when we and you like being called CJ, sure, I yeah. understand, and I mean, I've always called you that. But when we look back on this, will we look back on this time, or will future generations, where this was a, I'm not going to say a cataclysmic, but it was a major turn for religion, hmm. organized religion. We are in that in that uh, formation that seems to be just turning back to the days when when church. Uh, Revolve more around the home than the church itself, mm. by necessity, one way or the other. But uh, but speak to that because uh, we got a lot of things happening out there. A lot of it's causation of some of the corruption in church leaders. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some of it's a cultural thing from um, from the millennials' culture. But all of that's happening at the same time. Yeah, I, I do think you're right. It's a great time of of a, of a shift. Um, we're about fifty, maybe sixty years behind Europe. Europe is predominantly secular now. Mm-hmm. Uh, places like France, for instance, and in many states around the nation, you see this very hard secular move. And even in Mississippi, you start seeing more and more people coming out as atheists and agnostic when, you know, 30 years ago, uh, you couldn't really say that out loud because it was assumed everyone was religious. Uh, I think many of the scandals have been a part of that for younger folks. They've seen if you will, the deep hypocrisy, and that's the number one reason why a lot of young people turn away from organized religion. Um, And then you have uh, this increasing kind of pluralism. More and more young people are interacting with people of different religions or no religion, and when they raise the questions, they sometimes ask people who don't have answers for them, and so they they walk away. On the other side of that, there's a greater, at least in the uh, African-American community, a greater desire for the church to be present in many ways, uh, both in terms of things happening beyond the four walls and within, 
and churches that are able to sort of move beyond just maintaining itself and paying the bills have a way of reaching people uh, in ways that, you know, maybe uh, they didn't, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Well, it's a lot of times, too, and what I find is you have this battle of people leaving organized religion, mm-hmm. but they are, as far as the surveys are concerned, people uh, by a, a pretty good majority are still religious. They believe yeah. in God. It's just that they're not going to church or they're not in an organized religion itself. That's right. Uh, and I, I, I think in the future, and I've, we've talked about this before and, and did a couple of programs on there, you have a place – because of internet and video chat and things, so mm-hmm. it's almost when we talk about homeschooling. I think something called home churching yeah. is going to be something in the future. Oh, absolutely! Because I mean, people look for that, and a lot of people watch church not yeah. on television anymore on on Facebook. Uh, yeah. And and sadly, what you're seeing with big retail is kind of happening with a lot of churches as people yes. shop online, they go to church online, yeah. and so you have to do something in the building that that would cause somebody to get out of the bed, get in their car drive, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles or more uh, to the church. And so it does require many of our ministries to reimagine how we do things to bring people into the doors. But it's a lot like teachers, too. I mean, if you're sitting there and the, the kids law of uh, goes home and they're entertained yeah. by professionals on YouTube and all of this stuff, and they're captivating their teacher, Absolutely. then you get in the classroom and, and the, that teacher, man, white, uh, man or woman, white, black, doesn't really matter, young or old. If they're boring as, as, as everything, they're going to lose their attention. That's right. Yeah. And, and you, you've got to kick it up a notch. You have to. Uh, and, and so a lot of times we miss that opportunity, uh, especially with older congregations that are sort of technophobic. <laughs> they, they're scared of technology, scared of. And, you know, I actually had this conversation last night. We were having a debate about online giving mm-hmm. or, or electronic giving. And some of the older members saying, well, we don't do that. And I said, well, guess what? For folks who are 40 and under, if you don't have that option, you're not getting their money because they're not bringing cash or check to church. That's exactly so, right. So, yeah. you know, we're in a very different different space. Yeah. <laughs> you swipe your card as the, as the best. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that's it. That, that's the way it goes. Now, now to the watch, just flash the watch over there or something. That's but, right. Uh, uh, easy pay is a, it's, it's, it's just an incredible new time. Um, I want to get to the prison thing, too, sure. and talk about that because a lot of your ministry is on that one. But your thoughts so far as you look at this situation? Yeah, so I've been uh, the president of Clergy for Prison Reform since 2015, and we've been following prison and criminal justice reforms. On the whole, Mississippi is doing a good job of making changes in the law and applying those changes, Uh, but so much more has to be done. What we're seeing coming out of Parchman, we saw Walnut Grove, East Mississippi, different prisons, a lot of problems, and, um, and, and it needs immediate attention. And I'm thankful that the lieutenant governor and governor are making quick moves to try to resolve those issues. I, I think I know very few people who would disagree with this. We just haven't given it the, the attention, nor the money. And, yes. and both of those two things are the same thing, money and attention. Yeah. We haven't done that. Uh, we've tried to cut back on some of the, the, the budgets here and there. And uh, it's it, to me, it's a lot like municipalities and the mayors with their underwater, uh, their their water lines and sewer lines, nobody sees them, so they're you right. know just pass them on, and you can forget about them. But now it's erupted; the pipes are burst at Parchman and other places out there. The gangs are just uh, uh, uncontrollable; they're running the prisons for the most part. Well, you talk about the the monies, and and one of those um, realities is that a lot of the people who work, who staff the prisons, mm-hmm. are underpaid, overwhelmed. In a place like Parchman, mainly male with a few women basically working it. So until the state of Mississippi does something with the budget, it's going to be hard to get and keep the staffing necessary to, to maintain order. You should be on the task force. Hey, well, tell your friend Tate to put well, me on it. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tell you. You should have been on there. You should have been on the task force. Talk about this and more. It's all coming up with C.J. Rhodes next. is a Friday, and in the studio, Trustmark Studio, is... Uh, Pastor C.J. Rhodes and many other things to talk about. The, 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 the March for Life is going on today, isn't it, in Washington, D.C., protesting yeah. both the practice and legality of abortion held in Washington. Um, around the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, a landmark decision which was issued in 1973 or 74, President Trump is going to attend. He will be the first president ever to attend that. Uh, and that happens, my understanding is, today in Washington, D.C. Are, are, is, the, is the black communities, especially the church organization, 
is where are they as far as their protesting abortion compared to where they were 10 or 15 years ago? Yeah, I, I would assume that most African-American Christians abhor it, don't agree with it, mm-hmm. but instead of necessarily doing protests and stuff, try to you know reach out to the women who are engaged in making that decision. I talked earlier about the students at Alcorn. It's been amazing to hear the number of students at Alcorn, for instance, and these are you know teens and 20-somethings, who uh, either themselves had an abortion, regret it, or have some religious conviction against it. And so it's prevalent in terms of uh, a, a way forward, but a, a lot of times African Americans tend to look at kind of a whole life approach. Let's make sure we you know, protect the life of the baby in the womb. Let's also make sure we're doing things to take away the reasons for why the woman wants to have an abortion in the first place, economic, financial, health issues. And so uh, there's kind of this holistic approach, wraparound services, yeah that that uh we tend to sort of focus on well but but it's the same way as far as their admonishment or to at least to their leaders as far as black on black crime you know we got a situation in jackson that's not getting any better not as one that you've spoken about mm-hmm. but how do we solve that uh well i think you know another one of those things speaking out i mean there are a number of, of areas uh, wraparound services etc but for instance at mount helm on monday on mm-hmm. king uh holiday we had a, a forum on on gun violence and uh, a lot of community people came out uh there are people who are actively engaged in in trying to resolve the violence and you know victims of the violence um there was a lot of you know shake up when uh, mike hurst came out with his comments but you know frankly there were a lot of folks in jackson says here here mm-hmm. uh because especially older people in our communities uh feel especially uh overwhelmed and fearful uh, at times, that doesn't mean that every you know every day there's you know violence, but it's enough to where people should be concerned about what's but going I, on. Am I correct to this too? Though there are a lot of these older uh, uh, African Americans and boomers who have their houses paid for or been in their homes a long time. That's the only thing stopping them is their legal gun that they have. They don't want that yeah. gun taken or be, away from. Or them. because they're uh, yeah, or because uh, their house is paid for, they're not moving out to the suburbs, right. and so they do. Right. They stay there. Uh, and they, you know, and I think any Jacksonian, any person anywhere in the state of Mississippi wants to feel safe and secure, both in homes mm-hmm. as well as uh, when they go out shopping, they go to uh, the local grocery store or Target. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that is something that's been a big issue, particularly in certain pockets of the city. Uh, there's a, a pastor for them, a, a pastor, Arthur Sutton, who pastors in South Jackson, uh, maybe Southwest Jackson. Um, about two months ago, maybe a month ago, uh, there was a dead body on his church's property. Someone had gotten shot and he just died there. And it, he, he raised up and said, look, we've got to do something about it. So uh, interestingly enough, I think, though, when uh, African-American communities and churches rise up and speak to these things, that's not, as, that's not covered as much as when we speak about other things. But there, there's a lot of concern in our communities about One of the reasons I played that cut uh, a little earlier about Miss Daisy, the, the elderly lady that said she's had enough. And that was, I don't even know if she's still around. Uh, that was about five or six years ago, maybe longer than that, Perez, but it was quite a while ago. Well, when you when you look at good things happening, there are some good things happening. Uh, the, the employment rate as far as African Americans and everybody else is up. We are, we are all working on uh, workforce development to get the people who need a job a job. Uh, so there are some good things happening. We just need to we need to be more positive and not hear these naysayers all the time. Yeah, <clears throat> we were talking before we got on the air about yeah. the uh, young woman who uh, just purchased Metro Center Mall. And, oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And where uh, is she from? Do you I think, know that Perez? I think she's from Jackson. She ten million dollars. Well, she's not in Jackson anymore. I don't think. I think she yeah, made her money she's elsewhere. From Jackson. But I think she she's from bought Jackson. the Metro Center for ten million and wants to read. And I, I say the Metro. With it. Turn it back to a mall for the most part. Yeah, there's going to be the return of, st- uh, of the various vendors. There's also going to be a lot of stuff for like literacy, partnering with Heinz Community College, um, um, just different ev- so uh, entertainment things. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot, a lot of space to fill up, um, and that's really good for that area where you know f- that Highway 80 Robinson Road yep. corridor, where so many she, businesses have left. You know, it, it does bring a sense of hope. What back. is she? She apparently has been very, very successful. Yeah, I don't know. She would the be details. the enemy of AOC. And she would be the enemy of uh, Bernie Sanders, but she's apparently to be able to finance $10 million to buy that. And folks all over the state, I don't care if you're from the Gulf Coast or from uh, North Mississippi, one time or the other you've probably been. Uh, if you're certainly a boomer, you've been to the Metro. Mm-hmm. It's still the largest mall yeah. in the state of Mississippi. Yeah. You remember the days at the Metro uh, Center, don't you, Perez? Of course. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I grew up in Hazelhurst, and we would come up on weekends and yeah. spend the day uh, at there. And School Toys R Us was yeah. across there, and uh, the movie th- it was a movie theater. Remember that yeah. when we had a movie yeah. theater in Jackson, and so we would spend the whole day. Did they have a skating rink in there one time? Or was I think so. Uh, yeah, so that's one of the things she wants to bring. Like uh, she talked about these big entertainment spaces yes. in, in there yeah. for young people and kids, so and that will help idea. with some of the violence, right? When after school you can go to the mall and play basketball or skate yeah. as opposed to. Walking the streets. Are you uh, are you seeing some other young people back in the days when you were younger than you are yesterday? <laughs> were yesterday. Perez called you an old man. I didn't say he was old, but he's been coming on the show for so long. Yeah. Making him to come in with gray hair. And yeah, I, I, probably, I probably had no gray hair when I first ca- came on, and I have about 20 now. So. <laughs> 20? Hey. Oh, wait. wait a minute. It gets better, man. <laughs> he's, he's got five-year-old twin boys. He ought to have a lot yeah, more. Yeah, that'll do it to you, too. Uh, uh, gray hair than he's got now. But do you see some other... Uh, uh, young people getting into the ministry? Oh, certainly. I was, you know, talking about some of the students at Alcorn. Um, I've mentored over the, my my uh, almost six years there at least twenty young preachers. Um, one of them is uh, our associate and youth uh, young adult pastor mm-hmm. at the church. Um, oh my lord, yes, so many. And uh, interestingly enough, they're looking for mentorship, yeah. not just from older ministers say you know 60 and older but even for those in my in my age range what do you tell them or what's your stance on medical marijuana because we're going to face that coming up in november <laughs> well you if you do the research you saw i was one of the, the i uh, did you were on the advisory yeah board, and which, uh, which shocked me a little it bit did. But, yeah. well i talked to joel bumgar we had a very that didn't shock me <laughs> Joel, Joel may have some uh some some i don't know if he's got an investment in that or not but I'm not sure, but we, we've yeah. worked together on criminal justice stuff, and yeah. so he, he reached out and we talked about it, and we vetted through potential issues, and he said this is just the extraction for medical uh, purposes and whatnot. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of people who say they suffer from chronic diseases yeah. that, uh, you know, it avoids trying to get hooked on opioids. Uh, and whatnot, so it may be a solution. I know there are some people against it. I at least want to have a fair hearing uh, as we move toward the uh, the vote on it and to see so whether being or not on an advisory committee doesn't mean you're all in. It just means that you want to well, support. Yeah, more. support. No, no, no. Well, I'm saying I did that to yeah. to support it uh, when when so I you signed would on. Vote for medical marijuana. In I would. I, I do think uh, you know unless something great that contradicts that comes out that mm-hmm. that the use of it would be you know prescribed by doctors and used precisely for the kinds of things that it would uh, attend to, particularly various chronic illnesses that um, have not been remedied or people get hooked on opioids and other kinds of drugs to try to uh, self-medicate. So if this is a way that people who really, really need medical help can get it, can get over these chronic illnesses. Yeah. I'm, I'm for it. We're, we're, what's your task to do this as far as just go out and speak to it, or have you talked to some groups about it? Well, f- most of us who were on the task for, uh, not the task force, but the original um, advisory, advisory board, board yeah. were basically saying, we vetted this, we see the language of it, we've talked to the medical people, we've talked to the legislators who are backing it. We believe this would be kind of middle of the road. Yeah. Uh, so so others as a are going, pastor, you, fell, you feel like... You have honestly and truly vetted it enough that you're you're confident. Yes, I'm confident based off of the language of the of the ballot initiative, mm-hmm. and that if it were to pass, it could be used to attend to these chronic illnesses that many people suffer with. They have high medical bills to try to cover it, or prescription drugs, or get hooked to opioids. I'd rather that than opioid addiction. I'll talk to uh, the governor about the task force on the prison thing okay. next time I see him. I would love that. You yeah. got it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Always good seeing you. Don't be a stranger. Yeah, certainly won't. And um, we've got Dixon Williams coming in a moment or two. we got sports news as we get closer and closer to the